Hi. So I'm Laura Lynn. I'm going to be talking about designing with intent. So I'm not going to do a bio up front because uh, I don't have a lot of time. So if you want to know anything, feel free to ping me afterward. But one thing I will say is that people who've worked with me in the past and people who follow me on Twitter know that I'm a big old design nerd in terms of systems. That's what I spend a lot of time working on and talking about. But what probably only the people who work with me know is that I also was one of the main writers on every game that I've ever worked on. And that dichotomy really represents us as designers and as individuals. And over the past years and my experience, I've often had to loudly advocate with other people on the game team about the player's experience and how very important it is to make sure that that experience represents an emotional experience as much as it is a gameplay experience. And that dichotomy is at the heart of us as designers. We're always torn between instinct and reason, between things that are objective and subjective. And it means that a lot of times our design, uh, our way of evaluating design is sort of an I'll know it when I see it approach, where we kind of don't really know sometimes why we're putting in systems. We know that it sounds like it'll be fun, and then we wait and we see what happens. But what I found over the years is that as we become more restricted by budgets and resource counts and things like that, it becomes more important to understand what our target is and to understand, be able to answer the question, why should this be in the game? What purpose is it serving? And ultimately, the question is, what's your intent? So over the years, I've developed a you know, over time, a more intent-driven design process. And at the heart of that process, when you think about something like designing a shotgun, <coughs> is defining what is my intent for that weapon. And when you start talking about that, and I'll have a specific example in a few minutes, when you talk about it in respect to a shotgun, how do you expect it to perform? How do you expect it to behave? How are you going to use metrics to determine if you're correct? Everyone's fine with it, but when you start talking about that with things like level design and narrative, you start hitting objections. You start hitting this wall, this big wall of nope. Because we as designers want to act like some parts of our work can be quantified and some parts are mysterious and can't. We try to put up these walled gardens around things like narrative and around things like level design and treat them like they're less rigorous, less intense, less require less expertise which of course is a disservice to designers who specialize in those, require less focus than other aspects of our design work. And ultimately, it always ends up with this guy who's just really distressed that I would even suggest that somehow we can quantify our work on narrative and we can quantify the player's emotional experience. But of course we can. And so I'm here to sell you, I'm here to convince you that it's in your best interest and the player's best interest to approach every aspect of your design with the same quantification and the same rigor that you approach the typical KPIs and typical systems design. <coughs> so I think everybody here is probably familiar with the concept of data-driven design, where you make a design, you implement it, you test it, you go back to the shop and make more changes to it, right? We're all familiar with that, especially if you come from mobile or social. So what I'm gonna be talking about is intent-driven design that starts with your design intent at the root goes through what your success criteria are that you'll define very carefully, how you're gonna measure that, and then you analyze it. So, I'm gonna use an example of a game I didn't make, Crusaders of the Lost Idol, to walk through what I think everybody here will recognize as being the typical uh, test-focused design process. Crusaders of the Lost Idol, sorry, I'm getting over a cold, so little coughing and sniffling up here. Um, <coughs> Crusades of the Lost Idol is what I would consider state of the art in idle games, uh, in slash incremental games slash clicker games, it's in that genre. You have a bunch of heroes that you buy with the soft currency and upgrade. You can put them in a formation that makes them more or less effective. They go up against enemies. They uh, complete certain requirements like defeating a num certain number of enemies. The enemies drop currency. You can spend to do more upgrades. Eventually, you're gonna hit the wall grind do a reset, be more powerful, come at it again. So it's that typical model, but very well done. So they also drop chests. Every fifth boss, every fifth level has a boss that drops a chest the first time. 
has a chance to drop it every other time. Randomly, it can be upgraded to a jewel chest. So it sounds fairly straightforward. Again, really well done, but fairly straightforward. So let's say we're all designers on that game, and we got this data back from our metrics that the average player has 42 unopened chests. Or in my case, this is actually my screenshot, 79 unopened chests. Now I can tell you as a designer, I would be immediately alarmed and wouldn't would be driven to understand why. Because you get loot out of chests, why on earth would people not open them, right? So, I have this driving question now, why aren't players opening chests? Well, part of the reason may be because it's an idle game, you leave it running in the background, the chests may be dropping and people don't know about it. So they legitimately don't know that they have chests. So, data-driven design, we add this little pop-up that says, hey, new chests when they come back to the game. And let's say that that dropped the number of open open chests to 35 per player. So now, as a designer, I'm just obsessed. Like, why? Why aren't players open chests? I'm sure we've all been in this situation. So we say, okay, maybe it's because it's a pain in the ass to open 79 chests one at a time. So what if we let you open multiples of chests? And what if we made that a part of this alternate currency system that you can purchase an upgrade, which is actually what they do. So I'm sure this sounds familiar to everybody, but here's the interesting part for me. Let's stop for a second and think about it. <coughs> Why do you care if players open chests in this case? We all would care as designers, absolutely. That would be an alarming statistic to us, but why? When we added chests to our game, we didn't add them with the intent that players will open them as the only action, right? That's not what they're there for. They're not just for the act of opening. They're there for another reason. We had an intent. And you'll see that a lot of times we take things into our games because we assume they need to be there. Of course we have player levels. Of course we have chests. And we don't ever stop to think about why we might do that, right? We put the card before the horse. We make these assumptions about what we need and we never question why. And a lot of times that comes down to best practices. <coughs> because game A in our genre had this thing, we now think we have to have it too because it worked for them and we just assume it's gonna work for us. So what I'm talking about is stepping back a little bit. Is thinking about what am I trying to accomplish? What is my intent? And that's the start of the process is what is my goal? So it, here's the power of definition. If you take this example and you think about chests in a game like this, and you, you're, if you are thinking about why am I upset, so upset that players aren't opening chests, you're kind of thinking about it backwards. Really, if you start from the intent perspective, I want players to earn regular rewards. I want rewards to feed the crafting loop. I want rewards to tease RMT power-ups that you could get. And I could probably list off five or six other things. That's why the chests are there. They're there because of this intent. And that's why instinctively, all of us would be alarmed that players weren't opening them because it means these loops aren't working, right? So think about it in terms of what you want to have happen, not in terms of what's in your game. Get at the root, because now when you start talking about things like this, you're focusing all your thought and all your effort, not on the action of we should have chests and chests should have loot, but I want you want the player to feel or think or want or do. You're getting at the heart of the player experience. So what I'm saying is, that's the heart of your spec or your GDD. Every major system, every element in your game, even narrative, the bullet points for that should be your intent, a statement of what your intent is for that system and what you can do then to achieve that intent. So if we were designing a shotgun, these are some of the things that I would have to state my intent for a shotgun. It's high damage at close range, it should be balanced, it needs to feel powerful and decisive. <coughs> but if I make the statement of these statements of intent and I don't have any way to understand if I'm meeting that intent, I'm that tree falling in the forest that you know, doesn't matter because no one can hear it. It doesn't matter what I want out of a system or any part of my game if I don't get any feedback about whether that intent is working or not. And if you think about this with a really concrete example like ARPU, it becomes super clear. You would never have, an, or hopefully never, have a situation where you were told, our game isn't making enough money, make more money. And that's it, that's your only directive, right? You have an ARPU target, of course you do. You have a retention target, you're given that, or you set it yourself. 
right? This is what we consider acceptable, and then you plan toward achieving that goal. So what I'm saying is have that specificity with everything. Set a target for everything. So if we're looking at these first two things in the shotgun success criteria, that it does high damage at close range and it, that damage decreases as the range increases, it's pretty too easy to envision measuring that, right? You get metrics back from the game, you can chart it, you can figure out damage over distance, super clear. And in fact, it's the best illustration of the second two points there. So first, we're gonna set a goal of our intent. Second, we're gonna ask, how do we know if we've achieved it? And we're also gonna pair that with, how are we gonna measure it? Because those two go hand in hand. So here's an example from Full Spectrum Warrior. It was way before I had this as a formal technique, but it's a good example. So Full Spectrum Warrior was way too difficult. It launched way too difficult. Um, I loudly advocated with the game director for uh, making at least the easy mode easier, because it was absurd. And he wouldn't do it, because everyone on our team, everyone at the company, of course, was great at playing the game. So <clears throat> I got him to put, give me a number on easy mode. How often do you think a player should die or fail in a level? And he said four times. Cool. So I went to our publisher, THQ, and asked them to put a QA team who had never played the game on it. So these are hardcore console players that play a lot of games and have them play on easy and record how many times they failed a mission. Some of the missions they were failing 18 times on easy. And I was able to take that data back to the director and successfully get at least easy mode made more easy. And that was really the first time that I as a designer, and this is back in the mid 2000s, the first time that I as a designer ever really got to understand <coughs> the power of setting a goal, looking at the results, and changing your game based on that. So if you were working on a platform game, Let's think about difficulty for a second. We're kind of edging more toward those fuzzy areas of design that are less easy to quantify than shot, shotgun damage. So you're making a, a platformer. What am I asking you to do? Well, I'm saying you state your intent is for, like if, for example, this section of the game for this jump. Your intent is that it be a difficult section. What does that mean? How would you quantify that? Well, here's some ways you might quantify it, that this jump you know, on hard, you might have to miss it, you might miss it three times. On easy mode, maybe you only miss it once, right? How are you gonna quantify this? And yeah, I'm saying put numbers to it. And it's gonna feel like I'm asking you to be psychic at first, but ultimately as you start to quantify your expectations, to quantify your intent, and then get results back, you will be able to refine your design because now you understand it better. <clears throat> so you may be totally wrong, it could be, Failing one time feels too easy, even on easy mode. And now you've learned something and you're carrying that into the next game that you're making. So when you identify your success criteria up front, you're asking these sorts of questions. It's not just about how do I achieve the intent, but it's about what are my specific criteria? What does success look like? And sometimes you're figuring it out, I'll talk about narrative in a minute, but in areas like narrative, it's figuring out what success even looks like. And then how are you gonna measure it and most important, what tools or support or process do you need to be able to understand whether you're successful or not? And I'm saying put that in the GDD too. Document in your GDD, here's my intent for the shotgun, here's how much damage it should do, here's what I think the success is gonna look like if it's performing correctly, here's what I need in terms of metrics to be able to measure that. So when I talk about measuring the success of your design intent, and I'm talking about typical KPIs, like ARPU and retention. Everyone's fine. Sure, we already do that. When I'm talking about it with gameplay, things like shotgun damage, sure. Levels, eh, maybe. But then as soon as I talk, talk about doing all of this with narrative, we're back talking to you know Mr. Nope again, who just doesn't want to think that you could possibly do that and it's going to spoil his creative impulses. And you can see that drifting, right? The more the, inherent, the system inherently deals with numbers, the more people are awesome about identifying measurable criteria. The more it's about feelings, 
the less they're likely to want to do that. And it comes down again to that split in our work between objective and subjective. So measuring the objective, sure, of course we do. Measuring the subjective, you get conversations like this. So yeah, that's funny and I think it's funny too, but it's bullshit because we actually measure soft, fuzzy criteria all of the time and we quantify it all of the time. We don't like to say that we do, but we totally do. We just do it under the table and don't have any firm way of analyzing. Was the story in that game good? I don't know. It comes down to whether or not the person liked it. <coughs> and we wouldn't judge an ARPU that way. We wouldn't say the game is financially successful or not successful because I made a purchase, but we judge other parts of game design that way. So let's look at this last two things for the shotgun. It feels powerful and decisive. It feels exciting and risky. So how do I know how something feels? How would I quantify that? How would I measure it? We already know. You use testing and player feedback. Those are quantification methods too. Those are measurements too. Just as much as, as solid, you know, normal behind, behind the scenes metrics are. And in fact, getting feedback on your game from players in a variety of methods is just as valid as getting metrics from, that are delivered by your analytics system. And here are the, some of the ways that you can do that. And it's more than just you know, forums, right? There are a bunch of ways that you can do that. And by the way, reviews can be reviews of other people's games as well. So I'm saying don't just do this for your own game, do it for other people's games as well. So if we say that we can start to quantify things like narrative, start to quantify the success, start to quantify those subjective solutions, so player feedback for these two, right? About whether it feels just, you know, powerful and decisive and exciting and risky. What's awesome about that is it starts to get us past the obvious things that we would change and it gets us starting to think about things like audio and effects because we're talking about how the shotgun feels. It could be perfectly well balanced and people hate it, right? So how can we start to quantify? Well, it's player feedback that tells us, yes, this feels awesome. I like the shotgun, it's my favorite weapon, right? And that's just as important as knowing it's doing the right amount of damage. And that's important for narrative too, because we're lying if we say we don't have an intent when we craft a narrative, of course we do. We absolutely 100% have intent when we craft a narrative. But we don't track it. We don't map it. We don't put success criteria around it. We don't uh, evaluate how that affects the rest of the game or the rest of the experience. But we totally can't. <clears throat> There's services like usertesting.com and in-house usability where you can have people play your game and actually watch their faces when they go through certain parts of your game. You can, act, you can start to quantify it. You can do surveys. Which characters did you like or dislike and why? You can start to quantify even some of the more fuzzy aspects of your design if you stop and take a, uh, think about how you can get that information from players. And body language is a part of it too. Watching someone play your game is one of the most illuminating things that you can do. But it's about more than watching, it's about recording it, it's about writing it down, it's about making it a part of your process. <coughs> So again, that should go in the GDD. Even for narrative, state your intent for each section of what's happening in the story, and then think about what do I want the player response to be, and how am I gonna gauge that that's actually happening? And there's a huge free bonus that comes with this process, which is actually amazing. And that is that you included metrics and usability tests and surveys as a part of your development process. It's now expected that you're gonna do those things. You know when you're gonna do them. You've requested the systems for them, the engineering support for them. It's now a part of your process. It's not an afterthought. It's not something that's gonna come too late for you to be able to make any changes. <coughs> so this is an overview of the process as a whole that I've been talking about. The last step is super easy. I'm not gonna spend much time on it. It's just taking a look at how it did and then going back in and refining your intent, refining your goals. 
And yes, that should probably be a part of your spec as well. Certainly carry it into the next game that you do. Any learnings from the first game, formally carry those into the next one to set your expectations for it as well. So, when I think about this process, the reason that it's become more important to me over the years is that it becomes the foundation for everything you're building, and it's a player-centered foundation. Because at its heart, when you talk about how you want the game to perform and how you're gonna measure it, it's measuring what players are doing and how they're feeling and what they're experiencing. And it's ultimately, ironically, all for this guy. It's all for the person who doesn't want to quantify and doesn't think we can quantify some of the more fuzzy aspects of our design. <coughs> and here's why it's actually for him. Because when we say we can quantify things like narrative and things like uh, level design, we are giving them an equal seat at the table with other systems and with all of our KPIs. They now occupy just as much brain space instead of being an afterthought. And in fact, they should have just as, brain, just as much brain space and just as much team time because they drive players' attachment to our games. So that's why I'm saying, for the love of God, formalize it. Put it in your GDD, put it in your specs, make it a part of your process. <clears throat> Give the more creative and more player-focused parts of your experience an equal seat at the table to your KPIs. Because ultimately, it's not just about financial reward, which is you know, important, we all need to make money, but it's also about the player's experience. Because when all that we care enough to quantify is how we make money, then our, or how our systems work, our games become elegant machines, and they feel like machines. We start to lose the heart of our player experience. And ultimately, I think that's why we're all designers, right? Whether you work in casual games or casino games or AAA, you're here because you want to affect people, you want to create emotions, you want to create attachments, you want players to have an experience in your game. So we need to consider that experience just as critically and formally and systematically as we consider anything else in our, in our design process. So I can say personally that I'll never forget the first time I saw someone playing a game that I made. I think everybody probably has memories like that of a game that you made and the realization that you were actually affecting pe people with it. And that's my intent, is to affect people with the games that I make. So what's your intent? Thanks. <laughs> Introduce yourself. Hi, yeah, Tara McCauley from Pickpock in New Zealand. Uh, it's funny, the subject of your talk was exactly what I was talking about with my design director last week, so it's uh, very, very good timing. Um, one of the things I'm just sort of wondering, like you talk about designing with intent and measuring the performance of specific features in the game, but a game is a collection of many features, game loops, resources, many experiences inside of them. Do you have any kind of thoughts on how would you, you would measure things in aggregate? Like you, you talk about subjective things like reviews and things like that, but are there any other kinds of things that you think you would look at in, in order to try and judge overall performance of a, a title? Yeah, so uh, the question was about if game, in games with complex systems, how do you sort of roll up into more broad look views? I think roll up actually is the, the way I would look at it because if you think about, uh, off the top of my head, Skyrim, right? A bazillion systems going on in Skyrim. But if you try to back up and look at it from the broadest view possible about the player's experience, it's not about the moment to moment. It's about the progression and involvement in the story and feeling like I've grown and changed and I've seen new things. So I would define those sorts of very high level intent and then figure out what what I can quantify about the things within that section. Like I've seen a lot of things. We can look at exploration achievements, we can look at how we give experience for going into new areas, for finding things in dungeons, right? And all of those things can roll up into that much broader goal of players should feel like great about seeing new things. Does that answer your question? So I would just roll up into a broader, yeah, a very know. broad intent. So an intent that seems so broad that it's useless, but it's, it is useful because it's actually holding a lot of smaller intents below it. Yeah, that's good, thank you. <coughs> Other questions? We have time for one or two more. I was wondering if you had any advice for small teams who don't have access to like a Q&A testing group. 
how to find our statistics. Yes, so you almost certainly have people you know and friends and family who are in your demographic, whatever your demographic is. You have friends who have kids, you have friends who have grandparents, whatever your demographic is. So friends and family is a great way, just bring them in or bring it to them if it's mobile. Um, you can actually, a lot of times, partner with other developers in your area. Uh, if there are other indie developers around you, you can partner with them and try to have like a, a party night where your three of you have people come in and play your games, and then you might be able to together be able to pay people to come play through Craigslist or something. Um, a lot of times that'll be helpful too. But I would say, uh, and usertesting.com is actually surprisingly cheap. So I would look at them as well. They're, they're not that expensive for what they provide because you get videos of people playing it. But really, go, reaching out to friends and family and just inviting them down to your studio, especially if it's people who otherwise don't really get to a peek into the, the making games, that can be very appealing to them. Come test our game. We'll give you a studio tour. We'll have pizza. A lot of times, you'll get a lot of people who are super excited to do that. You can look at church groups and stuff like that, too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, don't forget to take a picture of Laura Lynn's contact information if you want to reach out to her. OK, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay.